If you are clicking through the internet today to do a little online shopping, you should probably be thanking Erin Montgomery Ward. Hi, I'm that history lady, and I tell stories from the past that bring history alive. If you like what I do, be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to get notified when I've got more. When Montgomery Ward started his catalog in 1872, there were only 37 states. The entire population of the United States was about 42 million. Most of the residents actually live clustered on the eastern coast. Out west, what is today called the Midwest, there were vast expanses of empty land just beckoning people to come. And it was still a rural country. If you look at the 1870 census, three quarters of all Americans lived on farms or in towns of 2,500 or fewer residents. If you lived out in the West, you were probably pretty isolated. Under the terms of the Homestead Act of 1862, homesteaders could claim 160 acres of surveyed government land west of the Mississippi River, provided they live on it and improve it. Now, 160 acres is a nice size plot. Your nearest neighbor, on average, would be about a, mi a half a mile away. How isolated you actually were, it would vary a bit depending on the climate and the topography. If you live, let's say, in the Dakotas, You'd be separated by your neighbors, both by long distances and by a lack of common language often and background. Your neighbors would often be strangers with ties to other countries. There were Swedes and Norwegians and Germans and French Canadians and others in that area. Life back home might have been tough, but it was never quite as lonesome and isolated as this. But there was one thing that connected isolated homesteaders, railroads. Railroads dominated lives of rural people in these days. They shaped their business lives. If you were a farmer, you shipped your goods like corn and milk and wheat to markets by the railroads. And railroads also shaped your personal life because shopping was largely determined by what the railroads could ship and did ship to small towns. During the real golden age of railroads, about 1865 to about World War I, American manufacturers were enjoying their own era of growth and transformation. In the years just before and after the American Civil War, newly invented products were being manufactured in vast new quantities. The very same manufacturing methods that were pioneered by Eli Whitney and Samuel Colt to make guns and revolvers could also be used to churn out things like clocks and cultivators and sewing machines and countless other things, all of it faster and better and cheaper. For many of these new products, rural farmers were the ideal customers. Families who are making their living off the soil in isolated places had few stores to go to. And the first person to really recognize the potential of this was a young man from New Jersey named Montgomery Ward. Now, Ward was still in his 20s when he started working as a traveling salesman for several big city wholesalers. He clerked for the leading Chicago dry, goodness, dry goods house, Field, Palmer, and Lighter. This company actually offered a really pioneering money-back guarantee. He worked for a St. Louis wholesaler that sent him out to many country stores marketing their goods. So he got a really solid education in commerce and in sales. And as he traveled the Midwest selling goods to owners of small general stores, Ward would talk with the storekeepers and he would chat with customers. A lot of these stores were the places you got your mail. People would go there to gossip and get the latest news. He heard farmers complain about the limited selection of goods and the high prices compared to big city stores. Ward had an inspired idea. What if he sold merchandise in an entirely new way? Instead of a small store that only stocked a few of each item, he could open a mail order store. His home base would be in a big city, Chicago, which was emerging as the railroad center of the nation. In a store like this, it'd be easy to keep a huge stock of all kinds of merchandise. He wouldn't need salesmen. He wouldn't need to pay rent on a fancy store. It was brilliant. It meant that Ward's customers wouldn't be just a few families living in a single community. He could sell to anyone, anywhere in the United States. I know these farmers, George. 
It isn't fair. Because they're stuck in the mud out there, they can't buy the things city folks can. Crossroads stores can't afford to stock any but the most common items. And many have to charge big prices. I'm going to buy for cash and sell for cash. Just a little above cost. Uh, don't you see it, George? First, it can mean that anyone, anywhere, right in his own home, can buy anything that he wants for less than he'll pay anywhere else. For this new, larger market, manufacturers will be able to make more of the same goods for less. That can mean lower prices for everyone, in the cities, too. Now, he didn't invent mail order. There had been mail order catalogs before this, typically, though, for businesses that sold individual items by mail. Uh, Benjamin Franklin reportedly had the very first mail order catalog. Uh, he sent out a catalog listing 600 valuable books. Tiffany issued its first catalog with some exceedingly rare gems in 1845. But no one had ever offered a full line of goods and sold them exclusively by mail. Montgomery Ward had supreme confidence in this vision. He wrote in his diary, having had experience in all classes of merchandise and traveling salesmen and a fair judge of human nature, saw a great opening for a house to sell direct to the consumer and save them the profit of the middleman. To give his new business credibility, Ward went to a group called the Patrons of Husbandry. They're better known as the Grange. This is a fraternal organization that worked to support and promote America's agricultural communities. And at about the same time that Ward launched his business, there were more than 20,000 Granges with more than 800,000 members. Ward convinced their leaders to make him the official Grange Supply House. That gave him access to their enormous mailing list and a patina of added credibility. Ward was all set to mail out his very first price list in October of 1871. But if you know anything about Chicago history, that is the same month that the Great Chicago Fire burned much of Chicago to the ground, including Montgomery Ward's small supply of merchandise. He was undeterred, scraped together funds to start all over, and the very next year, in August of 1872, he mailed out his very first price list. It was a single sheet. It listed 163 items with their prices. There were no pictures and only very brief descriptions of each item. The Grangers sent in their orders and pretty soon others were doing it too. The catalog caught on. And as Ward's customer base grew, the catalog grew pretty quickly too. And with it, the space for describing the merchandise. And Ward proved to be a natural here too, combining plain talk and old time aphorisms with friendly salesmanship. To reach his rural farmers, who were his primary customers, Ward ran ads in the very popular Prairie Farmer newspaper, and he packed his catalog with windmills, corn planters, farm wagons, plows, harnesses, all kinds of motors. Sewing machines were the catalog's best seller. Ward's enormous buying power let him keep prices ridiculously low, sometimes half of what retail stores charge. To explain the low prices, the catalog explained, we don't pay $40,000 a year rent. We don't employ high price salesmen. Our goods are bought direct from manufacturers and everything came with an ironclad guarantee satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Catalogs showed pictures of Ward himself and his key managers to reassure customers they were dealing with real people. If a customer sent in a letter without an order, someone at Ward's would send back a friendly reply. It all meshed perfectly with the era. Ward's innovative use of the railroads, his warm, friendly, honest writing style, this innovative uh, organization of his co company to keep prices rock bottom. And as developments in the printing industry continued to grow, the Montgomery Ward catalog took advantage of them. Descriptions started to get longer and longer. He added in illustrations. By 1874, the catalog had 32 pages. By 1876, it had 152 pages. By 1890, 535 pages. By 1899, it hit a whopping 1,076 pages. At this point, the catalog was going out to 729,000 customers, which made Wards the leading user of the US mail in Chicago. 
Country store keepers fought back. They railed against mail order. But Ward's catalogs always emphasized that the company was honest. Listen, this is going to be part of any catalog I ever print, any sale my company ever makes. We guarantee if for any reason you are not completely satisfied with any article purchased from us, you may return it at our expense. What? Well, you can't do that. It... Wait. We will exchange it for what you want or refund your money. And I'm going to sign it. You're crazy. You haven't left yourself any loopholes. I'm not looking for loopholes. I'm looking for customers. And the first thing I'm going to sell is satisfaction. If they don't get that, they get their money back. Mail-order shopping transformed life in America's farm communities. As the catalog grew, so did its importance in American farmers' lives. Country schoolhouse teachers used the catalogs in their schoolroom. Math could be taught by having students fill out an order form and total up the cost. The postal zone maps in the catalog that could be used to teach geography. At home, mothers kept on up on the latest fashions in the catalog. Girls cut up old ones to make paper dolls. Every new up-to-date catalog brought information about new machinery, new fashions, new time-saving gadgetry. And changing postal technologies helped Ma Ward's mail order business keep growing. Rural free delivery, of mail began in 1896. Before that, it was only residents of big cities who could have mail delivered right to their homes. Now, even rural farm families got their newspapers and letters and catalogs delivered right to their homes. In 1912, parcel post delivery began. Prior to that, customers had to pick up their orders at the post office or the railroad station or use private companies for any parcel that weighed more than four pounds. Now, customers could have their packages, even those weighing more than four pounds, delivered right to their door. During the heyday of mail order in the 1890s and 1900s, Montgomery Warren's churned out thick catalogs packed with merchandise. You can buy a facsimile of the Ward's 1895 catalog, and it's a breathtaking thing. 624 pages, tens of thousands of items, a bicycle for $45 and boxing gloves for $475, 100 bars of soap for $3.35, a piano for $210, eyeglasses, bathtubs, a corset for a nursing mother, an entire suite of living room furniture, high button shoes, flat irons, ice cream freezers, nails and screws in every imaginable size, page after page after page of jewelry, everything but the kitchen sink. Although actually, they had that too. The company barely exaggerated when it said it offered most every article required by the civilized world. It opened several mail order branches and built a 12-story building on Chicago's Michigan Avenue. When it opened in 1899, it was said to be the tallest commercial building in the world. Montgomery Wards had become an American tradition. It was also bypassed by its younger competitor, Sears, Roebuck, and Company. The Sears catalog passed Montgomery Wards in annual sales in the year 1900, and it never looked back. Monkey Wards, as a lot of its customers still actually refer to it, it served up a cornucopia of dreams to a lot of Americans living in isolated pockets of the country in those early decades. It really bridged the gap between itinerant peddlers and country storekeepers and the rise of department stores and the great chain stores that really flourished in the age of automobiles. We still honor mail order catalogs every time we buy something online and have it shipped right to our doors. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you'll join me again next time.